The second reading is uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17. Now, this is a section where Paul, in 10 and then again at, in 11, where Paul talks about the Eucharist with this vision. Can you imagine how enlightened he was? I mean, here it is. Our Lord just went to heaven a few years ago. And he's giving us this teaching, okay? Now, he's concerned in Corinth that um, they're kind of sloppy about the way they think about this. And so, they get mixed up with pagan services. They don't get mixed up in them, but they get mixed thinking about them. Or they have their own Eucharistic celebration in a home. And... Uh, the abuses that he counts there uh, in 1 Cor 11, starting with verse 17, you know, when you come together, uh, this stuff, do I praise you? You know, for that, I don't praise you. Um, and so, um, I just want to point out to you what he says there. Um, about this stuff is stuff. When you come together first, uh, there's, um, I hear that when you get together, there are divisions among you. These are the sins against the Eucharist now. There's divisions among you. Uh, and in part, I believe it. These things have got to happen so that the true one is really made manifest. And then you get together in one place, not to eat the Lord's Supper, but to stuff your face. He doesn't say it that brutally. And you you see, so you're all eating. Now, we don't do that anymore. We don't have a banquet. But you see, this was, would be in a home, usually of a wealthy person, big home, and everybody came in. James has an allusion to this too, and he says, we're told to be not just, you know, discerners or discriminate against people. And yet, if a rich man comes in to our Eucharistic banquet, oh, sir, sit right up here. Poor man comes in, yeah, you can sit over there on the floor. That's a sin. Of course, when we get to heaven, who's going to be sitting right here and who's going to be sitting on the floor? It'll be the big, you know, big change, the great reversal. Anyway, you see, so you're stuffing your face. And finally, it says, you see, everybody eats his own. And the, don't you have houses where you can eat? And then the last one, you despise the poor. So the divisions are, uh, I mean, the, the sins against the Eucharist are division, uh, self-gratification, and despising the poor. Those are the sins against the Eucharist. Now, before he gets there, uh, which is the heart of his teaching on the Eucharist, he wants to give them this grasp huh, of uh, what he's uh, telling them. Maybe if we read a few lines of the context, that will help. Uh, this is, I think I've already mentioned, this is 1 Corinthians 10. And... Uh, it's a question there of uh, uh, people get mixed up, you know, and they go and they buy meat at the temple, and yet they're thinking, gee, maybe it's jinxed, maybe it's, you see. And he's saying, look, there's only one God, you know. But anyhow, uh, I'm just going to read uh, first. Uh, you see, this whole chapter is about food and drink. I've already mentioned a part of this. Um, you see, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our, an our ancestors, 75 or more percent of that community in Corinth, were, had been pagans. They weren't. But they're still our ancestors, you see. And they passed through the sea 
all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they followed from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. That's alluding to a rabbinic tradition that the rock, the source of water, went with them in the desert. You see? These things happened, typicos, the text says, as examples for us, that we may not desire evil things as they did, and do not become idolaters as some of them did, and it goes on to talk about that. So it's in this context, you see, that he's going to tell us this uh, uh, story here, you see. Uh, and he begins, therefore, uh, in verse, uh, uh, he should have, well, he, the text actually begins in verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, avoid idolatry. I'm speaking for sens to sensible people. Judge for yourselves, what am I saying? And then the text, what do we have? The cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Think of the vision. Think of the understanding. Think of the faith knowledge that this cup of blessing, this potidion of, uh, of blessing which we bless, is it not kinonia? Communion in the blood of Christ? Well, is it? What difference does it make to you? When you go, where's your head? When you're at Mass, where's your mind? We're before the thing that keeps angels on their face. We are going to share in the blood of Christ. And it's going to make us one because we eat the same body and drink the same blood. Now, if we ask the Holy Spirit to help us, huh? there's an old Latin expression, quotidiana vilescunt. Huh? Things we do all the time get to be very common. This is a daily food for most of us or many of us, weekly for all the believers. Are we ready? Do we know what we're doing? The reason, one of the reasons we have a hard time, the, the food of the bread of the word has to be absorbed and digested and taken in before we can really take in the food of the body and blood of Christ. That's why preaching is so important because it breaks the bread of the word and makes it accessible so that people's hearts and lives are changed so when they get to the Eucharist, they hunger and thirst for him. That's the point. Well, how do we do that? Don't you see why the church wants good music, good preaching? It's to prepare our poor little hearts so that it just doesn't become a ceremony. It's a sacrament. That's the problem they're having. You see? Um, you see? Um, I'm speaking to sensible people. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Now, what does that mean, you see? Now, when we reflect on John, we'll get this idea of how much Jesus Christ wants to give himself to us. I'll give you my body. I'll give you my blood. I'll give you my life. Now and forever. Uh, and that's what he's telling us. So it's the kinonia. We're all one. That means I cannot hold a grudge against anybody and go up there to receive the Eucharist. In the old days, it seems, they had the same ceremony we do. They received the body of the Lord in their hands. And Augustine said, now when you hold out your hands and I say, Corpus Christi, and you say, Amen, look around. Look around. It's that Corpus Christi you're going to receive as well as the Corpus Christi. You can't, if you leave anybody out of that, you're not receiving the body of Christ. It's a challenge, isn't it? That's why in the Eastern Rite, there's this moment, the doors, the doors, let us attend in wisdom. It's becoming a ceremony there too. I mean, everybody who doesn't believe 
or was too mad at their neighbor, they all go out now. Uh, you've been here, you've heard the word of God, that's going to do you some good. But if you have anger in your heart, if you don't have kinonia, then this is not for you. Isn't it going to be wonderful when the whole church is so renewed that we take this seriously? And if we were in church, the Eastern Rite has this. It would be nice for the Roman Rite to have it. You see? So when we see somebody walking out, what do we do? We pray for them. He can't even receive the body of Christ because he cannot receive his neighbor who is also the body of Christ in another way. So this is what this kinonia, you see, and the bread which we break, is it not kinonia in the body of Christ? His body. We all receive it. And what that, as Paul says, therefore, one bread, we are one body. But I don't like so and so. Too late. You're baptized. You gotta love them. Well, it'll take time. Of course, it'll take time. But that's the power of the Eucharist. If when you receive the Eucharist, you say, "Lord, I receive so and so too," and I pray for them. The wonders the Lord can do with that. The wonders. You see, it's not a ceremony; it's a sacrament. And so, you see, what the Isartos. There's one bread, there's one soma, and we're it. You see? Uh, we, though many, are one body. That's the way that our liturgical translation goes, you see? Uh, isn't it not a, a kinonia in the body of Christ? You see why the, the church wants us to have a very short text, very confronting. All the text says is what? Do you know that when you drink that cup, you're having communion with the body of Christ, not just the body of Christ, Christ, the whole body of Christ. And when you eat that bread, you have communion in the whole body of Christ, and you make one body with him. If we would let the Holy Spirit move us and so change us that the Eucharist had its way with us, do you know what would happen? People would be knocking down the doors to join us. Your people are happy. You're not worried about the stock market and the wars and the tornadoes. You pray for people, but you're not nervous. You get along. You like to be together. Let me in. What's the secret? Secret is Jesus, my friend. Accept him into your heart. Get a little formation. We'll baptize you, and you will be plunged into his death, and your sins will be blotted out. That's a pretty good deal. And so, see, we who are many uh, are all partake of one loaf. And that's why we're one. Because that loaf is the body of Christ. So, on this beautiful feast day, you see how we're confronted. We only have, you know, uh, two verses for the second reading. We just finished them. But it says, look, do you understand what's going on? You receive the body of Christ, Jesus. That means he brings all his friends with him. You receive the blood of Christ. You live by his body and blood, as does everybody else who has faith in him, who is baptized in him, who is free from sin, you know, from mortal sin, and comes to this table. And for the others, you pray. Amen. Amen.